This conference will now be recorded. Dear Heavenly Father, we come together to study your word and better understand you. Thank you for your graciousness and mercy toward us, your children who love you. Lord, as humans, we tend to drive ourselves as if everything depended on us, and yet the stress that we carry on the inside can undermine our ability to even meet our challenges. So we forget that you, Lord, hold all things in your very capable hands. We can trust you to line up the circumstances of our lives to work out your perfect will for our good, as you say in Romans 8, 28. Father, may you comfort those who are grieving, those who have lost loved ones who have gone on before us, and we pray for many more of our leaders to be saved so that we can can have peaceful and just lives. We also lift up all the spoken and unspoken prayer requests represented here and ask that you open our hearts and minds to your world and better understanding you and growing in our relationship with you. And we pray all these wonderful things in the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah, it's in his precious name. We thank you in advance. Amen. Amen. Okay. And uh, if you're following along, we're in the book of Psalms. And uh, our curriculum calls to start with Psalm number 70 tonight. Um, so I just mentioned to you that uh, just about um, uh, eight weeks ago, we studied Psalm chapter 40. Uh, that was on July the 11th. And Psalm chapter 40, verses 13 through 17, uh, is nearly identical to Psalm chapter 70, verses 1 through 5. And so uh, we have a lot to talk about in the other Psalms tonight. So being that we've just covered this material in Psalm 40, I'll just refer you back to my YouTube channel, uh, you can look up uh, Psalm chapter 70, or you can look at uh, what we recorded on July the 11th, and you'll find all of the verses uh, contained in uh, Psalm 40, along with the commentary and along with the comments of those who attended uh, that evening. So let's go ahead then and uh, advance to Psalm chapter 71. Uh, and Psalm chapter 71 is a bit of a, uh, a mystery as far as who wrote uh, these verses. Many Bible scholars think that Jeremiah, the great prophet, wrote this psalm. And the reason why they think that is because uh, this is one of those later psalms, one of the later psalms that were written. And we know that because it's a collection of earlier psalms that were written, uh, some of the phrases came from many of the different earlier psalms. Uh, nothing here is original, but maybe we can uh, call this <laughs> David's David's greatest hits. Okay, <laughs> this might have been something uh, on on the top the top fifty or something on uh, what was that guy's name uh, that used to do that? Casey David. Kaysen. Oh. Casey Kaysen maybe would have would have uh, covered this. Uh, David's greatest hits. There's some uh, someone put together, and likely this was uh, put together by someone who was an elder man. It's a picture of an older man uh, late in his life that he finds much difficulty within his life, and he turns his trust only to God. Uh, and because of that, Psalm 71 has become a favorite psalm to many who are blessed with uh, becoming elders in their community. All right, so uh, what we want to do is we want to read the first, uh, we want to read 14 verses here. So um, let's see, uh, Nancy, can I get you to read one through, uh, one through seven and then Arnie uh, verses eight to 14? In you, O oh Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. 
be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me. You are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, for the hand of the wicked, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and the cruel man. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust. O oh Lord, from my youth upon you I have learnt, leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been as a burden to many, but you are my strength, strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together and say, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is none to deliver him. O oh God, be not far from me. O oh God, make haste to help me. May my accusers be put to shame and consumed with scorn and disgrace. May they be covered, covered who seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. Yeah, so would it not be great if we get to a certain age in our life and then all of our trials, all of our tribulations, all of the troubles are over with? Yet, we know that will only happen um, after the resurrection when we wake in paradise, uh, paradise in heaven, and uh, our human nature seems to want to link our circumstances of life uh, with the praising of God. When things are going well, we find it easy to praise God. And yet notice what the writer is saying here in verse number 14, I will hope continually. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans that if we hope for something, that has the meaning or the value that we do not have something that we're hoping for. The writer here says, I will hope for you continually and praise you more and more. We don't see, uh, prior to this verse 14, we don't see the writer thanking God for answering prayers first. We don't, we don't, we don't see the writer saying, God, thank you for killing off all of my enemies, uh, or thank you for delivering me from some issue. And so now I'm going to praise you. That's not what's going on here. But rather, prior to verse 14, there's no deliverance. Uh, the writer is saying prior to, to, prior to deliverance, I will praise you more and more. <laughs> In other words, uh, he is saying that his deliverance is not linked uh, to uh, God delivering him. Uh, his praise is being offered up to God, even though he still has challenges in his life. Even though God may not have delivered him through the trials and tribulations of life, he's still offering up praise. We are to praise God based upon the hope we have in God, based upon the trust we have in God, based upon the promises God has granted to us, uh, through his covenant. Uh, why? Because God is worthy of praise. All right, who's got a comment or a question about the first uh, 14 verses before we move on to the next section? Sylvia, go ahead. Welcome, Pam. Hi, Pam. Hey, there she is on a Monday. Nice. On a Monday. We didn't recognize you, but we do. Yeah. We, we read your name on the screen. That's right. <laughs> oh, <when laughs> I, I can't come Thursday, so that's <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So, so just to just to kind of recap what we just covered in Psalm 71, the Lord is our rock; He's our fortress. Uh, in Him we can trust and hope. He's our protector, our strength, our deliverer, and our helper until we pass over the River Jordan and meet Him in heaven. He is worthy of our worship. So worth. You know, worship is all about 
his worth his worth because of his worth that we worship him and that's what the word comes from the word worship comes from yeah good job who else go ahead carrie on me on mute please okay um i like verse five um and this is somebody speaking for me <laughs> um he says you are my hope and and he has trusted god from the youth and also verse six i find it inter interesting well my my verse says you I, it uses the word holding so you have held me up from the time i was born i mean that to me that says a lot to recognize that it's god that has kept him or her from the time they were born not only that but it was god who captured them from the womb that they made it in the first place as a living soul. So to me, that's deep honor. And and then they praise him uh, continually. And then he said, some, to some people, I'm a wanderer. However, let them be confused. Good job. Like Thank you. Good nice. job. Who nice. else has a, a comment or a question? Go ahead, Nancy. <laughs> Oh, just a comment on verse 9. I think of many of my friends here. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. There's a lot of um, pain, loneliness, desperation when you're alone. And I think of Debbie at this with this verse. Yeah. Don't, cast, don't cast me off. You know, bring pe my people around me. So, yeah, it's a sweet thought there. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you remind me too of uh, of uh, going all the way back to Genesis chapter two and verse nineteen, where God says, "Man should not be alone." That's why He gave Eve to Adam. Uh, we're not supposed to be lone rangers uh, in our walk of faith. We're supposed to stay in community. That's the first reference to community in Genesis 2.19, and it's a constant theme throughout the Bible. And I think Nancy's right. Uh, this points it out again. Uh, and we have a lot of people uh, who are suffering, who are mourning, who are being challenged in their lives. And the natural tendency is to uh, withdraw from community and to be alone until you can get through this, but that's not the way, uh, that may be how human nature is designed, but that's not how our faith is designed. Our faith is to stay in community so that we can have unconditional love and support and encouragement uh, in the community of believers. So good job on that, Nancy. Welcome, Boyd from uh, Stone Mountain. Uh, good to see you, brother. Uh, um, who else has a uh, comment about the first 15, 14 verses of Psalm chapter 71? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead, Carrie. Verse 1 is so prevalent nowadays because, because uh, cast me not off, but during the time of COVID, this verse was so important because it, anybody who got COVID, even the old and the young, it was like you had to be cast away and you know, your relatives couldn't even get to you to even give you a touch. So that is not what, that was not, that's not what God intends for our lives. Just like you said, Genesis, what was the verse? Genesis 2? 2.19. 2.19. That, that man should not be alone. That's why he gave Eve to Adam. Yeah, that's not his intention. So I think we are recovering from that to now be able to touch, to hug, uh, and not feel like, oh, wow, um, you know, it's, but, but the stigma is kind of still there. Good job. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Uh, Dan. Yeah, can you read uh, verse three for me, Robert, out of your? Sure. Welcome, Boyd, by the way. 
Uh, may those who say to me, oh, sorry, that's the wrong, uh, I'm, I'm back in 70. Um, uh, be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me for you are my rock and my fortress. So I just thought it was interesting. Give the command to Not save me. Give the command or the commandment to save me. So David's asking for God to give the commandment to save me. Who's he commanding to save David? Seems like it's messianic to me. Mm -hmm. Yes, this could very well be. Mm -hmm. Not sure this is David who wrote it, but um... whoever whoever the writer is, he's he's asking God to give a give the commandment. And that that first time that commandment word is used is back in uh, is back in Genesis two sixteen. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, from the tree of the garden, you may freely eat. And so in this context, it's it's like he's telling someone or asking that uh, Jehovah, in verse 1, it's Jehovah, uh, give the commandment to save him. I just thought that was yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah, and so that could... You know, and and a, a lot a lot of these verses they have a literal meaning, and then they also have deeper spiritual meanings mm -hmm. to them as well. Good job on that for pointing that out. Any other comments? Yeah, go ahead, Sheila. Hey, um, just I love when I see uh, righteousness. Um, deliver me in your righteousness. And um, God defines righteousness, and um, we're to to wish for it, and that's our safety. And see, He's going to protect us. We're to want it, and and part of it is in obedience. Um, obedience is our testimony to God's righteousness. Uh, because we're kingdom people, and I gotta keep plugging in. We're kingdom people, and Amen. when we submit to His instructions, God is the fortress. We are under His protection. And uh, number four, they talk about the wicked. It's an enemy, immoral. Um, it doesn't matter who the enemy is. We're not to fear. We're protected. Um, we are under, we have God's fortress, his righteousness. He is the refuge. So no fear. That's why the Bible is telling us no fear. It's said more and more. Um, and he says here, you know, we're to praise God. Um, the work emphasis is on God. And um, are you committed to the righteousness of God? We have to ask ourselves, if you are, God's commandments will be important. Even if we're not under the law, that it's through the spirit of revelation of God's word, we're able to apply his commandments so we can have the righteous testimony. And, and this brings, this is our testimony of God um, in our life. And again, kingdom people, this is all about God's kingdom. Good job. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Go ahead, Pam. Well, it's like the pastor has said um, this weekend, past, Pastor Steve, that um, you know this is not this is not our home. Basically, is what he was was alluding to. We 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 will not we will not uh, be safe. Uh, God will protect us, but we're still going to have tragedies happen to us. But it's like a, a movie I saw once where there was a big coliseum and the lion was going to kill all these people and the man was holding his little girl and he said to her 
it'll hurt for a few minutes, sweetie, but then you'll be in heaven with Jesus. Mm. And and so that uh, that really got to me. I never forgot that little one line one line in that because they were going out in the Coliseum and they were going to be torn apart by this lion, you know. But he told his little girl, "It'll hurt for a little while, but then we'll be with Jesus." And so don't wow. be afraid. Don't be afraid. So being afraid and doing all the things we did for for COVID, it was like, you know, wh why did we do that? <laughs> you know, yeah. when your time is coming, it's coming. <laughs> you're not gonna yeah. you're not gonna change that, no matter how much you hide in your house and don't hug people. And I really missed hugging people. Yeah. Well, you know, and Sylvia even said that to an oncologist once. She, you know, he was saying something about me and taking tests that I didn't need and uh, or that he thought I should have. And Sylvia says, what's the benefit? And he said, he just wants to know. And he, and, and, she, and Sylvia said, well, we know where we know where we're going. Uh, we don't need that test. If we're Christians, we know that the Lord, if the Lord wants us home this week and you say he has another five years to live, then guess what? We'll see the Lord and, this and, week. And vice versa. And vice versa. Yeah, if, if you say if I'm dying say, and the Lord wants me here for another five years, he's going to be gonna here. Stay. <laughs> so it's all up to God. That's, That's right. right. It's in his hand. All right. Thank you. Good job. Uh, any other comments? All right, uh, can I get Dan? I'll oh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, so Sheila was uh, talking about righteousness. In verse two, it says, in your righteousness, rescue me and save me. So the word righteousness and save, uh, that's Strong's H6666 and H3467. And when you uh, search for verses, that show those two ver words show up in four verses in the Old Testament. Um, so I'm going to read from uh, one of them is Isaiah 59, which kind of kind of circles back to our Ephesian study this week that we did on, on last Thursday. 59:14 says, "Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away." For truth has stumbled in the street and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and one who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Now the Lord saw and it was displeasing in, in his sight that there was no justice. And then in this verse, it's where it intersects with this uh, verse in Psalm. Uh, Isaiah 59, 16 says, and he saw that there was no one and he was amazed that there was no one to intercede. Then his own right, his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. Verse 17, he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrath, wrapped himself with zeal as a cloak. So I just thought it interesting that righteousness and save in verse two end up in Isaiah in that same that same uh, similar verses. That's interesting that um, salvation is predicated on righteousness. It's the foundation of salvation because without righteousness, no one could be saved. And there's only one who is righteous, and we know who that is. Yeah, so it's imputed, which makes us as right, righteous as he, as Jesus is. But what I'm saying is, is that if Jesus were not righteous, he wouldn't be in a position to save us. But he is. I remember back when we were talking and teaching uh, Revelation, uh, and and his righteousness and his strong arm saves us. So. He stands from a position of, uh, you know, the Melchizedek. You know, he's the he's of the order of Melchizedek, which is the righteous king. He's in a position to save us because he's righteous, and and the wages of sin is death. So that's evil, and evil demands blood to, as a repayment for sin. 
and uh, and Jesus, because he is righteous, stands in a position to be the only one who could save us from sin. Good job. Okay. Um, so, Dan and Sheila, can I get you to read uh, uh, verses 15 to 19 and then 20 to 24? One of you, 15, 19, and then 20 to 24. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness of yours only. O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. For your righteousness, God reaches to the heavens. You have done great things, God, who is like you? You who have shown me many troubles and distresses will re revive me again and will bring me up again from the depths of the earth. May, your in in may you increase my greatness and turn to comfort me. I will also praise you with a harp, your truth, my God. I will sing praises to you with the lyre, Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you and my soul, which you have redeemed. My tongue also will tell of your righteousness all day long. For they are put to shame, for they are humiliated who seek my, my harm. Thank you. Okay, so notice that even though this writer is an elder person, uh, he he still believes that there is a reason for him to be living. There still is a purpose in his life. One of the lies that uh, that the that the devil is going to whisper in your ear is that all oh, you're you're too old, uh, go away and just die. There's no purpose for you here in this world. And yet throughout scripture, the Bible places a very big and great value, uh, a great premium upon the elder brothers and sisters within the church. We're taught that the aged will transfer wisdom and transfer knowledge to the younger generations. You know, we live in a society, a culture today uh, that is youth worshiping kind of culture uh, where the youth call all the shots in our communities. Most of them treat anyone over the age of 40 as though they're worthless. Uh, and I believe that this culture is not going to benefit with that type of environment with that type of attitude, because the Bible clearly teaches that wisdom is for the elderly to convey to the younger generations. The age transfers wit uh, wisdom, the age transfers knowledge to the younger people. We've got people on this call tonight uh, who work with the youth. Why do they work with the youth? so that they can lead them and guide them in godly ways. The aged are supposed to transfer wisdom and knowledge to the younger people, the younger generations. And what the writer is saying here is, is God, please keep me around. I, I, I will be faithful to speak to the younger generations, to transfer my knowledge and to transfer my wisdom. All right, who's got a comment or question? Anything having to do with Psalm chapter 71? And I'll just point, I'll just point out that uh, you know, uh, 
what a blessing it is. Um, as we start to get older and we realize uh, our own mortality, but what a blessing it is that God grants us to get up into our 70s and then into our 80s and then into our 90s. And some of us are going to experience like Boyd's mom was into her hundreds. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and you, you stop and you talk to these people and you find out all kinds of wonderful knowledge and wisdom that they have gained because they've been studying the Bible, they've been learning righteousness, uh, and they transfer that knowledge and that wisdom to, to even us who are in our 70s and 60s and 50s, we get great knowledge. But the younger people, the younger generations, all of us as we're aging, we have value in life. God wants to use you for as long as he has granted you time on, the, on this earth. God wants to use you to take your wisdom and your knowledge of the Bible and to transfer to younger generations. Who's got a comment or question? And also not just your wisdom of the Bible, but your witness. Okay, your personal witness is powerful. Amen. Okay, people can argue all day long about the Bible back and forth, and they can make all sorts of, of assertions and presumptions, but they can't argue what God has done in your heart. And when you have a personal testimony, like for instance, us going through all this cancer or scare that we've had and this, and you know, and during our marriage, I mean, it, it's been a long and winding road, but it's done nothing but strengthen our faith. We see God working in our lives and that is the most powerful witness you can give. And nobody can argue what, God has done to save and to heal Rob, and he is healthier than the, than the day I met him now. Well, and I think just to build on what Sylvia is saying is that uh, as we age, as we get older, and as we look toward to, uh, to those who are older than we are, uh, th there's been a lot of experiences that that the elders have had where God has has carried them through uh, whatever the situation was, whether it's financial or emotional or, or um, uh, uh, physical, uh, whatever the case may be. And God has delivered those people a lot more years than the younger people. And so we go to those who are older than us to seek wisdom and and so in comfort, yes, just like it says in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3, 4, 5, uh, God comforts us so we can be comforted, and then we can comfort others uh, with that experience. And so Sylvia is absolutely right. As you are gaining in your age, uh, you are a useful tool. You are the most useful tool as you age for giving wisdom and knowledge to the younger generations. Who else has a comment? Uh, go ahead, Arnie. Yeah, a 94-year-old woman once said that when she had an earache, she drank a glass of wine. When she had a headache, she would have a glass of scotch. And when her back hurt her, she would try gin. And when she was sick to her stomach, she would actually have a martini. And they said to her, what, when do you drink water? She said, I've never been that sick. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Lord has carried you a long way, but there is a long and winding road ahead, I think. <laughs> well, we're happy to be on that journey yeah, with you. Yeah, we're on okay? the journey with you, brother. <laughs> uh, well, anyway. you, you gave, you gave uh, Howard a good chuckle there as yeah, well. Yeah, there you go. So I wanted to build on what Rob was saying. Elder believers are to be active in passing on the wisdom of God to the younger generations. One doesn't retire from Christianity. So many people think, oh, I'm retired. So, you know, I'm just going to sit back and twiddle my thumbs and read the Bible occasionally. No, you know, I mean, I know uh, of, of people who are bedridden 
who are prayer warriors, who are accomplishing more for the kingdom than most Christians today. Yeah, and so as we age, <clears throat> do not allow the devil to whisper in your ear that there's no more use for you because of your age. That that's a lie from the pit. That's, that's right. what our culture wants to teach you. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that you are a useful tool for the Lord to share your wisdom and to share your uh, your knowledge with the younger generations. Who else has a comment or question before we move on? Go ahead, Sheila. And then uh, Boyd, you'll be after Sheila. Go ahead, uh, unmute that, please. Uh, she uh, Sheila, unmute. Um, I just love. There. 20 or well 19 also your righteousness oh god is very high you who have done great things oh god is who is like you you who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again bring me up again from the depths of the earth you shall increase my great greatness and comfort me on every side the resurrection we the we are kingdom people we this is showing our resurrection with jesus it's so beautiful so i i really like that part right there thank you good job uh, boyd go ahead yeah just a comment uh on my mother who you have you knew both you and sylvia knew her uh that um as she was getting older she just seemed to be thriving and um on her bucket list at 102 she still wanted to go to alaska she still wanted to travel to scotland and she wanted to buy a new house yeah. <laughs> i thought that was pretty good that she uh she uh she was looking forward she just had a the joy of the lord was in her life and that was her strength yeah that's right yeah and uh what a joy it is and was to talk with uh, nell uh as she was approaching the 100 we were at her 100th uh, birthday party and um and uh, i think we were at another birthday party that was 102 102, <laughs> 102 right uh, over in Buckhead, but uh, what a joy it was just to sit and talk. And, um, you know, and I, I get that same great joy when I sit and talk to uh, to Howard, because uh, we, we talk about all different kinds of things, and uh, I've gotten a lot of knowledge and wisdom. So don't allow the devil to whisper in your ear that you're not worthy, you're not needed, because the Bible teaches just the opposite of what the culture teaches. Bible says you're a useful tool for God and that you can convey wisdom and knowledge uh, to the younger generation. Sylvia? Yes, and to build on what Sheila was saying, uh, he restores us by the strength of his outstretched hand. Okay, where did he get, where did that come from? That came from the cross, okay, with his outstretched arm. Amen. And, and it's a precursor for the cross, so so much of of what we've seen in Psalms is is uh, is is premonition of of the return of the coming of the Lord. Good job. Any other comments before we move on to Psalm seventy two? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Carrie. Wanted to comment on what the Sheila said, verse nineteen. Oh God, who is like unto thee? I was just reading today, I think it was John 7, and um, Jesus was talking and they were angry with him of what he was saying. And the Pharisees were, you know, they they wanted to take him away, but, but it wasn't his time yet. The verses kept saying. Then the officers came to the Pharisees and they said, well, wh uh, when can we take him away? And then they said, this man is like speaks like no other person we've ever seen and it was like he was untouchable 
So that's what that reminds me of. So we have we have that to stand on as Sylvia's talking about the strong hand. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, and nothing, we're gonna nothing can snatch us from the hand of God. We're going to be okay, getting it's good into to remember uh, in times of stress when people are attacking, nothing can snatch us from God's powerful hand. We're going to be getting into the gospel of John in about a week, uh, verse by verse. <clears throat> and what you will learn, uh, what uh, Carrie's saying there is uh Jesus was not captured because it wasn't his time. He didn't allow them to take him. But when it was his time, when he was ready to give himself as the perfect sacrifice, as described uh, in the Feast of Passover, the perfect lamb to be lamb. sacrificed for the propitiation of sin, <clears throat> it, was, it was only then that they were able to take him because he granted it. But before that, every time they attempted to grab him and kill him, uh, when they were plotting to do so, he didn't allow it to happen because it wasn't his time. He had the full and complete power, and he gave himself up when he was ready, not when the Pharisees were ready or the That's or right. the Roman soldiers. That's right. Yeah, good job on that, Gary. So uh, Psalm 72 has a subtitle in most of your Bibles. It'll say the Psalm of Solomon. Some of your Bibles might say it's the Psalm 4. Solomon. We know that King David, the father of Solomon, is the one. Uh, is it was a man of war, a man of war, and the fact that he was a man of war resulted in all kinds of great extended times of peace and prosperity for the entire nation of Israel. David handed over to his son Solomon. Uh, what would be equivalent to billions of dollars of wealth for the building of the temple. Remember, David wanted to build a house for, for God, and God said, you have blood on your hands because you're a man of war. And so he didn't accept the, the, David to, to uh, build the temple for, for God, but uh, that was turned over to Solomon. And David turned over billions of dollars of wealth for the building of the temple. Solomon was likely at this time uh, around the age of 19 or 20. And you can imagine, as we read these verses, you can imagine that an elder father, a dad, uh, who was David, uh, and we know that he was nearing the end of his life when he wrote this psalm, and he is handing over uh, the incredible responsibility to a very young son Solomon to become king uh, uh, and to take over the responsibilities of leading uh, a very prosperous and a very safe nation of Israel. He's handing this over from a father to a son. Um, Pamela, would you start us off with verses one and two, please? I'll have you read some more in just a minute. Endow the king with your justice, O God the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. Uh, thank you. So David is asking God to help Solomon make uh, right and righteous choices, right and righteous decisions, not what easy decisions are to be made, but to make uh, uh, the right decisions, not something that's comfortable or easy, but right and righteous decisions in the eyes of the Lord. Pamela, continue. Three, four, and five, please. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. Thank you. Boyd, can I get you to unmute and read verses 6 through 10, please? May he come down like rain upon the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish, 
and abundance of peace till the moon is no more. May he also rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Let the nomads of the desert bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. Let the kings of Tarshish and of the islands bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba offer gifts. Thank you. Carrie, can I get you to unmute and read verses 11 to 15, please? All right. Um, yea, all kings shall fall, fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he shall deliver the needy when, the, when he crieth, the, and the poor also, and him that has not, no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. Yeah, one more. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. Thank you. Howard, can we get you to read verses 16 through 20, please? May, is this on? May grain abound throughout the land, on the tops of the hills, may it sway. May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. May the nation, then the nations will be blessed through him and they call him blessed. More to 20? Yes, please. yes, please. Praise be to the Lord, God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And there's one more. Go ahead. This concludes the prayer of David, son of Jesse. Okay, good. And so, uh, you know, um, Dan was talking earlier about some of the verses that were prophetic. Uh, it becomes obvious as we read these verses uh, that these verses are also prophetic. David is looking all way past the role of his son, King Solomon. Uh, he's looking way out into the future uh, when his other son, the Messiah, is going to rule and to reign over the entire earth. Notice that he says, all the kings of the earth shall come and bow to him. Now, when you read scripture, uh, when you read the, the first and second kings, you read uh, uh, the history books within the Old Testament, you don't see all the kings of all the nations coming to bow down to King Solomon. And so you have to stop and look at this, and you have to see that David is projecting out and being a prophet here because. We know that all the kings of the earth will come and they will bow down to Jesus Christ. He talks about prosperity. And then uh, even uh, on top of the mountains, there is going to be produce grown. Uh, there, there will be uh, an incredible harvest on the mountaintops. The prophets saw a time uh, when righteousness would be covering the earth just as water covers the ocean and the sea. Uh, the prophets foretold a time when, uh, where the nations would send representatives every year 
to the city of Jerusalem, and there they would be taught by the promised Messiah, and he would teach them the written word of God. And if representatives would not come, those nations that were not represented would not receive rain. God would not bless them with rain for that entire year following when they did not come to study under the, the promised Messiah. And so David not only sees glory uh, uh, for Solomon and for his ruling and reigning over the nation of Israel, but also he sees down the tunnel of time, he sees the glory of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus, the promised Messiah, as Jesus rules and reigns over the entire earth during that period of time called the kingdom of, of heaven on earth. Notice in verse 20 that the prayers of David are ended. Uh, that was the last verse that Howard read. It says, it says that the prayers of David ended. And so as we come to the end of Psalm chapter 72, we come to the end of the second book of Psalms. If you didn't know, uh, and I don't think we've talked about this before, but Psalms is broken down into five different books. Um, and uh, what we have already covered now are the first two books of Psalms. Um, uh, and the first, seven, uh, the first 72 uh, Psalms, 60 of those 72 Psalms in the first two books of Psalms that we've covered 60 of them are attributed to David as being the author. The remaining 78 Psalms, only one of those 78 uh, that remain are going to be attributed to David. And so the rest of the book of Psalms will be written by a variety of authors, a variety of scribes, and hopefully I'll be able to give you some instruction on that as we go through it. Who has a comment or a question on anything we discussed in Psalm chapter 72? Sylvia? Okay, so David asked God to help Solomon, his son, who is now king, be right and righteous and a defender of the poor and needy instead of an, a manipulator and, a, and, a, and, a, and someone that rips them off. Uh, that's what a, a right and righteous leader should be. And um, and this is the prophecy of also their defend, uh, descendant, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So uh, it's, it's good to live under a right and righteous ruler. And that's why David is praying to God that God will bless his son Solomon in that way. And he did. God answered. And he also blessed the descendant, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Also, I thought it was interesting that it talked about the incredible harvest on the mountaintops. I guess, Pam, you're in charge. He's in charge of mountaintops. You're in charge of the incredible harvest on the mountaintop, apparently. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, who else has a comment or a question about some? uh chapter 72 anybody because otherwise we can move on go ahead uh, carrie that's fine thank you i just wanted to say how amazing i think this is i had not i don't think i'd ever noticed it psalm 72 and it's talking about david and how he's praying for his son and then in first kings you know he is close to death and he gives this um it's like you know he gives this what do you call it a prayer or a, a declaration to his son about how she he should act so i'm amazed and i look here and then i i see all these things that he wished for him mostly he's telling him to stand tall as a man and you know he tells them all which way he should act I think it's in the second chapter. And then he goes into what he wants him to do to make sure the kingdom is secure or is established, which Solomon did do 
which meant the death of a few people, but the kingdom was secure. So I, it's amazing to see how, um, you know, when people say they don't believe the scriptures, but if you look at how things are correlated, it didn't, it couldn't have happened by itself. Yeah, so we've heard Dan and Sheila oftentimes, as well as Sylvia, say how uh, all of the scripture, Old and New Testament, are, are are closely knitted together like a tapestry. Uh, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> and so I think what's interesting that you're pointing out here, Carrie, is we've talked about this in our study of Psalms, is that if you start reading First and Second Kings. Uh, and you read uh, uh, um, First and Second Samuel. Uh, you'll find a lot of history there of 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 historic events that actually happened that were involved in in the business of running uh, uh, the nation of Israel under David, uh, David's rule and Saul's rule and Solomon. And uh, and so that that gives you historic events of what happened. Then we get into the Psalms, uh, and David authored you know some sixty plus Psalms uh, that he wrote during those historic events that you read about in Kings and in Samuel. Uh, during those events. We knew the history, but we didn't know what his heart was speaking. We didn't know what his what his mind was thinking. We didn't know what his feelings were, and that's that's kind of like uh, the rest of the story. You 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 study the the history. Now you know what he was thinking and feeling. You and and this is where you can see he had a heart for God, even though he had all of those real challenging historic events that we read about. But now we can know what his feelings are as well. And you know, and, and credit to Dan, uh, who earlier was talking about some of the verses being not only uh, uh, current uh, 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 literal translations, but they were also prophetic. And here we've got oh, a great deal of prophecy in this one uh, psalm that he's not just talking about uh, the benefit of of uh, Solomon ruling over Israel, but he was talking prophetically about Jesus ruling over all the nations of the world during the kingdom of heaven on earth. Who else has a comment, a question, or a takeaway before we move on to the next, um, uh, to chapter 73, which will be our final uh, for the evening? Sylvia? So one other thought that occurs to me is that, you know, all parents should be praying that their children be right and right, okay, and defenders of those who are unable to defend themselves. I think that's what God is leading us to here because, you know, our the second greatest commandment is to love one another. So in, we need to be actively involved in praying for one another and praying, especially our children and grandchildren, and, and that they, and that they recognize and become right and righteous. Good job. Okay, any other comments? All right, so we're uh, we're going to start now in Psalm chapter 73. This is a psalm that was not written by David, but rather was written by Asaph. Now, Asaph was one of those uh, uh, musicians uh, now, I can say this because I was a professional musician for over 20 years, uh, uh, kind of a moody guy, okay? He had his ups and downs, uh, uh, so he was a temperamental, um, uh, moody kind of a musician, uh, and uh, he's the one who wrote this. So let's take a look. Uh, let's go back up to uh, Arnie. Would you read just verse one to get us started in 73? Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Yeah, so there's a certain foundational truth that we must have in our Christian faith. Um, and verse one is one of those foundational truths uh, of Christianity. 
and that is God is good. Kind of got a kick out of this uh, when we started uh, preparing this lesson because uh, most of you who are connected to uh, me on my Facebook page, uh, I publish each of these uh, Bible studies uh, and I let people know that we uh, we had nine or ten or however many attended uh, and what we studied. And then I I finished that posting with God is good. And uh, and then I found out that I was doing something really special here because here it says uh, in verse one that God is good. And that is that is a foundational truth that we must have as believers. It does not matter what happens to you in your life, uh, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, we must always remember that God is good. This does not mean that we can not question God. I mean, it's okay. Uh, uh, you know, you can say, God, I, I don't understand what you're doing or why this is happening to me. Nothing wrong with speaking to God, but you have to remember that he is sovereign and he is good. And whatever it is he's doing, even if you don't understand it, God is still good. And whatever he's doing is for the benefit of the kingdom and he's using you for kingdom purposes. So your current situations, whether they're good situations or bad situations, doesn't matter. That is not an indication of whether God is good or not. If we find ourselves in life where we forget that God is good and then trouble comes our way, our faith is in a real trial. And so Asaph uh, begins with, God, you're good. In other words, before he gets into his complaints about what's going on in his life and, and, and what he was expecting from God, but he's not getting so far before any of that happens, He's praising God. He's saying, God, you're good. Uh, um, Arnie, read verse uh, two, please. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had merely slipped. Thank you. Uh, Sheila, can I get you to read verses three and four, please? For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no pains in their death, but their strength is firm. Okay, thank you. So we can see that this faith, uh, that, that, that Asaph's faith was shaken. He almost lost his faith because he witnessed the world being governed in a way that was different than how he would govern it if he were God, right? This likely can happen to most of us. I mean, most of us have probably uh, can testify and say, well, uh, I've said this before, you know, I watch what's going on uh, with our current government or even our former administrations. And we've looked at them and we said, well, if if I were president or if I were the king or if I were God in ruling this world, uh, you know, all of these bad leaders uh, uh, would be would be gone. All of these dishonorable governing agents would be uh, eating dirt and and put well, I'd put them on the island of Patmos, Patmos and, uh, you know, and lock them all up. You know, and I would turn this thing back around again if I were God. I mean, that's what our human nature um, uh, would think. And then we would say, well, and now the rest of us, after we put all these these bird eaters into Patmos, into prison, uh, and everybody would follow uh, the written word of God, and we would all love our friends and neighbors and driving BMWs and that kind of thing, and we'd all be very happy, and uh, God would be happy, and we'd witness a really happy life. And oftentimes, you know, those uh, who love God the most, they, they, they seem to have some of the largest burdens to bear. Asaph says, you know, I started looking at the unrighteous and began to wonder what is going on here. Our human nature has the delusion that if, if, 
if we love God, if we're obedient to God, then we're going to have a happy life, a peaceful life. And, and that's just not what the scripture teaches us. Asaph is saying, I'm looking at all of those who are unrighteous and life seems pretty rich to them, pretty easy. And I'm kind of wondering what's all the, what's it worth? You know, why, why am I going, you know, why am I suffering uh, so that I could follow God? That's kind of what's going on here. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Dan, five, six, and seven, please. And then Howard, eight, nine, and 10. They are not in trouble like other people, nor are they tormented together with the rest of mankind. Therefore, ignorance, therefore, arrogance is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart overflow. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. Thank you. Uh, boy, can I get you to read the next three verses and then carry the next three verses after that? Yeah. I think we're at 11. I can't hear you, boy. I just. All right, thank you. Uh, Carrie, you're next. Uh, unmute, please. Okay, I'm reading 13. And they, uh, 14, yeah, and they say, how does God know? Well, these are well, hands in, in a. Having a little bit of delay. Go ahead, uh, Carrie. Okay, I'm reading 13, 14, 15, and 16, Carrie. Okay. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Yeah, so if you're envious of the wicked, you will be led to the wrong conclusion as Asaph has experienced here. And, and uh, any one of those uh, wrong conclusions um, uh, was, well, one of those wrong conclusions was, it just does not pay for me to serve God. Asaph was taken uh, back by the prosperity uh, of the lifestyle of the wicked, and then he's thinking, here I am, I'm serving God. I don't have even two shekels to rub together. Every morning I get up, I still have problems. And he's essentially saying, why in the world am I doing this to myself? You know, why am I attempting to live a righteous life? Why am I attempting to be holy? Why am I attempting to serve God? Uh, he's saying it doesn't pay to serve God, that's his human nature taking over. Those people do not serve God. Those wicked people do not serve God, and yet they're living this Epicurean lifestyle. They're, you know, they've got plenty of money. They've got all kinds of assets. They're, they appear to be happy and partying all the time. And uh, and and Asaph has come to this false conclusion that it seems like God does not care about me. And with a bit of honesty, as we get to verse 16, he says, this is killing me, God. This is painful. I don't understand what's going on. You know, uh, why do the righteous suffer? You know, and then why do wicked people prosper? So 
he he now is going to get the answer. Uh, this is pretty interesting. So um, let's see. Um, uh, Pamela, would you unmute and read verse 17 only? Verse 17. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Yeah, so I think this is probably one of the most important lessons that we can learn even in our culture today. When this guy, he, he, he goes to God, he says, God, I don't understand what's going on. It appears to me that the wicked, they're, they're living a lifestyle. Uh, they're, they're, they got plenty of food, plenty of assets, plenty of fun. You know, and I'm serving you, God. I'm trying to be righteous, and I don't understand why I'm having so many challenges. And then here's the sanctuary of God. And then he says, I understood their final destiny. When he came into the sanctuary. He had an understanding of the eternal realm. When he came into fellowship with God and the teaching of the wisdom of the written word of God, he instantly understood the eternal realm and it brought correction to his human perspective. It brought correction to his human nature. He was blinded. Uh, um, he, he, uh, he, he, but now he can see. When you live out there in our culture, our human nature tends to have a perspective of, of now time, of linear time. We live in a linear kind of time frame. God lives in an eternal time frame. God has been at the very beginning. God has been at the very end. And he's been everywhere in between. We just have a linear perspective. And as soon as this man goes into sanctuary and gets back into his relationship with God, God reveals to him, takes away the 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 um the, the covers the blinders from his eyes and recognizes that there's an eternal realm uh, you know we as human beings we have we're influenced by media uh media of our culture and we have a tendency to forget that this lifetime that we have whether it's 60 years 80 years 100 years whatever it might be it's merely on a linear scale, uh, it seems like a long time, but on the eternal scale, it is just a very small moment in all of eternity. And all of the media that we listen to and we see that's placed before us has us forget that and wants, uh, creates a want and a need for everything uh, in the now time. So when Asaph walked out of, of the culture of now time of 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 temporal uh perspective and he walks into the sanctuary he stepped into uh the he, he stepped into the sanctuary he instantly received an eternal perspective he stopped looking outward at all of these wicked people who were partying and becoming millionaires on TV. And he started looking, instead of looking out at, at media, he started looking up at God. And he sees God's eternal plan. Uh, Pamela, finish uh, 18, 19, and 20, please. Finish with your reading. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Yeah, so looking at our temporary life perspective, uh, he thought these wicked people were very lucky, very fortunate, but then he looks at the eternal perspective and he recognizes, he realizes that those wicked people are not fortunate at all. Notice in verse 20, he's saying, 
this all looks like a dream, but when you wake up from a dream, we have to thank God, you know, that it wasn't true. Uh, it's not reality, and that is that is the way the, the way life is. Uh, there will come a day when we wake up in the presence of our Lord, and we're going to understand that the dream, the dream was only. The life we had here, it was only something temporary. We're going to wake up to the reality of eternity. And that this life is merely just a moment. Uh, uh, the reality of life that awaits us when we wake up in the presence of God is that, e that our temporary life is, is just a moment. This life we have is just a moment. We have, we have eternity with the Lord. There will not. Um, so those people who are living their life solely for this life, for the rich and famous in this temporary, when they wake up, they're going to have an eternal nightmare. Terror is going to await them. You remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 42, and this is what he said. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is forever. All who enter hell abandon all hope. The horror of hell for even one second is unbearable, but forever. Yeah, so remember this. Uh, it is Jesus who will be throwing them into the fire of hell. And that is the terror that awaits all of those who live a wicked life in this lifetime, uh, where they do not want anything to do at all with Jesus Christ. Um, Howard, can I get you to read verses 21 and 22, please? When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was a senseless and arrogant. I was a brute, a brute beast before you. Yeah, so when Asaph came to this understanding, to the sanctuary and likely feeling sorry for himself, and as he began to reflect upon God and the eternal perspective, uh, that opened up his eyes to see the truth. Um, and so, um, Carrie Crawford, could you unmute and read verses 23 and 24, please? Right. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I am continually with thee, that thou art holding to my right hand. Thou shalt guide me, guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Amen. Yeah, so he realizes now, he realizes that he's, that God was with him the entire time and all he was doing was just whining and complaining why he couldn't be like the rich and famous, uh, yet God was right there with him through all of his difficult uh, situations. Arn, can I get you to read 25 to 28, please? Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. And so notice he begins in verse one by saying God is good. And then in verse 28, the last verse, he says that it is good that I draw nearer to God. The closer you draw to God, uh, the more effective you'll understand the eternal perspective. Uh, notice that God, uh, notice what God requires of man. Uh, and this is the very same thing which God is requiring for you and for me. He says that I may declare your works. Now, how can we declare 
the works of God. But what does he say right before that? He says, I put my trust in the Lord. Now, how can we declare the work of God without first placing our trust in God? If we're living our life, uh, if, if we are living our life, we are in panic mode. We begin to think uh, that somehow uh, I, I, uh, um, uh, it doesn't pay to serve God. Uh, but when we get that eternal perspective, when we, when we start praying to God, uh, that God, let me be a better witness. Uh, and we understand that God helps us through our troubles and through our struggles of life. Um, uh, 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 we can be a better witness. We can do the work of God. Um, and, and, you know, and if you're complaining and whining all the time about the challenges of life from a, a perspective of a temporary life, what kind of a witness would that be for, uh, for those people who are watching you? You see, God wants you to praise him, to know that he is good, that he's working in your life, even when you're in times of struggle. And when you take that perspective and you take that eternal perspective and you show contentment, you show peace, harmony in your life, contentment, because God is good and God is working in your life, that is how you can be an effective uh, witness uh, for God. Now, if you're someone watching this video sometime in the future, uh, you're watching a recording of this video and you have not given your heart, you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, uh, there's, no, there's no coincidence that you're watching this recording. God has placed you before this recording because God wants you to invite him into your life so that you can have an eternal perspective and that you can live with eternal blessings in the family of God. If you have not made that commitment, you believe, you believe that Jesus died for your sin on the cross. All you have to do is say a very simple prayer. You can use the pause button uh, and, and read this prayer out loud, and God will accept you into his eternal family. Boyd, would you mind unmuting and telling us what that prayer sounds like? Yes, Rob, it sounds like this. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you said that prayer for the first time watching this video, we congratulate you. We welcome you into God's family, and we encourage you to continue studying the written word of God. Uh, before we have any final comments, we have a few minutes remaining. If you have any comments about Psalm chapter 73, I'll just remind you that uh, this coming uh, Thursday, we have a very special uh, uh, Bible study, <clears throat> uh, a little bit of Hebrew perspective uh, from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Um, I'm going to give you the literal translation, and then I'm going to give you a more deeper spiritual meaning uh, that we can learn. Uh, from these verses, from the actual Hebrew language, which is the language that God used uh, when he spoke the universe into existence, where there is no arbitra arbitrary uh, anything in Hebrew. Every letter, every jot, every tittle, uh, it has a very special and multiple uh, use and meaning. And I'm going to uh, give you some very interesting perspective interesting to me. I hope it is to you. And so that'll be uh, this coming Thursday evening. Um, 
and I'm going to let we'll you learn all about the parasites. We're going to learn about the Hittites, <laughs> the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, <laughs> the per Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, the seven nations that the Jews were to, uh, <laughs> the spirit, the giants that they were supposed to, uh, to, slay. to slay in order to get into the promised land. And we're going to learn a more, not only a literal meaning, but a deeper spiritual meaning of that. And I promised this uh, to Boyd on a telephone conversation almost two years ago. And uh, finally getting around. Thank to God it. <laughs> I've been busy with other Bible studies, but I decided this is where we're going to work it in. So I hope and pray that you choose to join us. Uh, next Monday, we're going to be studying Psalms chapter uh, chapters 74 through 77. And then uh, a week from, uh, two weeks from tonight, I'm sorry, a week from Thursday night, uh, we will start the Gospel of John, uh, verse by verse, and commentary. And it's going to be a, it's a big undertaking uh, to go through John verse by verse. Very important lessons in there. Uh, and uh, being that it's a new study, you might consider inviting a friend or a relative who might benefit from studying the Gospel of John. We hope and pray that you can invite people and join us as well. Any final comments before we close in a prayer on uh, Psalm chapter 73? Sylvia? Okay, so we need to place our trust in, in God, that he is a good God. And then we can praise him and recognize his goodness. And then he bestows on us the blessing of shalom which is peace and fulfillment, wholeness, wholeness and contentment. Isn't that, isn't that the good life? You betcha. That's really the life that we want to attain. You betcha. Anybody else have a comment before we adjourn? We close in a prayer. All right, fair enough. Um, I, would, um, I would just like to thank each and every one of you for your faithful attendance. Thank you. Uh, we love you, each and every one of you, and appreciate you uh, being in our lives. Uh, Carrie has been holding her hands up in prayer, so I'm going to call on her to uh, unmute <laughs> and to close us in a prayer. Uh, thank you for volunteering. Uh, for that, Carrie, sure if you just, did, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, we know we can always depend on you to pray uh, before God. So uh, thank you for that. Unmute, and let's go ahead and close in prayer. You clapping that we had a great class, and yes, I will pray. Uh, <laughs> dear God, we just thank you for the miracle that we experienced tonight in what we have studied in the Psalms that we have studied and we learned about David and about Asaph and how they truly felt in their hearts, which sometimes is not too different from what we feel. So it gives us guidance and clarification of our own feelings and what it is right to feel and move to, to know that God is a good God, that he loves us and that he knows everything about us and that we are in his inheritance and and there is future in him and and to know that we don't have to look to what's going on in the world we don't have to look to the fun of the world or, or feel that we're left out of something because we also even talked about what is coming the messianic times lots of good food even on a mountain so we we don't have to worry about what is going on right now and we learned this tonight in these psalms which is is miraculously described and we thank you for the word the true word we thank you for the references we thank you for every reference everyone shared and may we all take it and may it be put in our hearts that we may understand it and that we may apply it and live it. Bless us each as we depart and may we all go in wellness, joy, peace, shalom. Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you so Thank much. You.